Hey, beautiful human, I'm Zach. That's Dan. We yep. welcome to the studio. First time ever. Hardy's here. Yo. You're talking about tattoos before. You have a fresh leg. Yeah, yeah. I just got this one. Um, the Aperol Spritz. Uh, God, I don't even. Um, what motivates it though? Like, why do you get tattoos? I, you know, I started late. I got a couple when I was young, <clears throat> and then I kind of, and I, I like truly did it because I wanted. I just wanted to be like rebellious. You know what I mean? Like, I just, I was like, I, I was like, I want to get a tattoo and be different or whatever. And then I, my the first one I got on my right arm is this like wristband, and it's the wristband that gets into the, like the county fair where I'm from. And so I made a decision to dedicate this to like every, that, like where I come from and like my hometown and stuff like that. And then once I kind of just got older and sort of, I guess, matured a little bit and realized like you can t so somewhat tell a story with your tattoos. I know that sounds so snooty. No, or but whatever, it's but true. <laughs> it's cool. Yeah. So I, I just I don't know. I, that's that's why I do it now. And then I I'm, I've dedicated like the above my knees to like my my dumb or like drunk tattoos or whatever. And I've only got two so far. So I'm. I'm doing pretty doing good. well. Wait, I love that that one is your wrist, like to your county fair. Yeah, I have a, I have like the coolest county fair in the country, where in my hometown. Where are you from? Philadelphia, Mississippi. Interesting. And it's called the Neshoba County Fair, and it's actually going on right now. One week out of the year, the whole town like shuts down, and they move out into this like redneck Truman Show looking neighborhood that's that's literally abandoned. For like nine months out of the year, they turn the electricity on in the summer so people can go out there and party and stuff. But it's like this neighborhood of these like cabins. And for, so like a typical county fair, you go for the day and then you go back home. But this one is like everything else is the same. Like they have country people come play and they have horse races and like, you know, the midway or the carnival and they have this and that and the other. But you stay there and you're and they all these cabins are family owned. They get passed down in like what? wills and split up in divorces and shit like that. It's crazy. It's cool. It's Dude. it's very it's a very hidden piece of Americana that like a lot of people don't know about, but it's really cool. Different. Yeah, and I've been to my fair sh share of fairs, like mm -hmm. and all throughout. You know, I did. In Memphis and none of oh, is that Mid South Fair, dude. I yeah, I've been to Mid South. Yeah, I like Delta Fair is really fun. They have some great fairs. Yeah. I mean, dude, America is known for that, but I've never once heard about a fair that you can actually sleep at. Dude, you should go. I mean, I'm not kidding. It is. When's the last go, time you went? I went last year. Do you go every year? Do you own this a cabin? Is, my family does. Yeah, they've mm. had it since I think like the fifties. That's nuts. It's like 175 years old or something crazy. So your roots run really deep in Philadelphia, Mississippi. Dude, so I did Ancestry a couple years ago. And we, so my family has has lived in Neshoba County since, the, since before the Civil War. Wow. From Wilmington, North Carolina. I think it was Wilmington or... Uh, Maybe not Covington. I think it's Wilmington, but a long, a long time. Like my even my grandfather could could trace like his family back to like that mid eighteen hundreds. Do you feel like a part of that is why you feel so connected? Totally. To where you come from? Yeah. Like my wife, it, she she is enamored by the fact that like because her her grandmother is first generation, her grandfather is first generation, and then her other two grandparents I think are second generation and i was like i'm like seventh <laughs> generation um but yeah i think so i'm like very proud of that because because i when i go back home like i look at farmland and stuff and just things that my family built that are you know like there's a barn close to where i deer hunt that's like 100 years old it's still standing and like my great-grandfather built it it's pretty cool that's nuts. i love that stuff so how much of where you come from has made it into your music over the years like all of it, right? I think the the like country language that I speak, it's it all has to do with where I come from. I wouldn't be able to articulate, especially like speak the language of small town if it were if it weren't for like my my raising, if you will. Do you like feel the, like you give that perspective to even other artists? I think so. I think there's sometimes when they're like, "What the fuck are you talking about?" <laughs> and other times, um, maybe I do. I, I'm not really sure, but. Probably some a little bit, I think. I mean, every I feel like every country song that I that I have written has a, a little piece of my hometown. So if somebody else has cut it or you know recorded it, then it's probably you know it's got a little bit of, a little bit of Philadelphia in there. How does the session begin for you compared to working with somebody else? Like when I'm writing for myself, yeah, no different. Really, mm -mm. 
Well, so this, the process of you alone, I mean, will you ever write in a studio with the artists you're writing for or usually just... So, yeah, a lot of times. Like yeah. uh, Cole Swindell. I don't know. There's a million people. I wrote like probably wrote once a so week. so many songs, dude. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy. Uh, I mean, I... I um, is it hard to process? Like writing so many songs? No, the fact that you have a catalog that is really fat. In a good way. In a beautiful way. Like in an amazing way. I don't know because I mean, like, I'm very fortunate that many of the songs I've written with people that they've recorded. But when I think about how many songs that I've written and like just the hundreds and hundreds of rooms that I've been in, like over the past, I mean, really since like probably 2016 is when I started like getting in rooms with artists and like actually being able to write songs with the artists and stuff. It's well over a thousand. So, I mean, I think you just, you, your result is based on how much work you put in and, and, like I, I will go back to Nashville Monday afternoon and I will write a song with somebody on Tuesday. Like I'm obsessed with it. But that is also the energy that is Nashville, right? Yeah. And that's like we talk to musicians of all kinds all the time. And the biggest differentiator between Nashville and LA is this idea that like you work on a schedule. You work you you keep this routine, right? And like Yeah. It's like it's like work. It's like a job. Th- yeah, like it doesn't feel like five. a job. But it's like a nine to five. Yeah. All rights. It's 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 starting to change a little bit. And even when I moved to town, rights started at ten a.m. and now they're eleven. And now they're <laughs> and then they, some can be noon and some can be one or whatever. But dude, you go into a publishing company at ten thirty, eleven a.m. and there are, if it's a you know fairly big company, five or six people in the, in the break room making coffee, standing around talking. And a few minutes later, they all go into their separate rooms with their other people. I mean, it's just like going into an office. But all, the only difference is they're not on a computer doing so. They just go in and they write a song. But the process is the same everywhere, like, all the time. In, in every every building, the process is basically the same. So back to process. You, same exact style, same exact flow, writing for somebody else than it is for just writing for you. Yeah, it's it's exactly the same. I really feel like that. I mean, all this, all the rock stuff that I've written has been, has all been like Nashville, right? Like writers just try, we're just trying to figure out how to, you know, to write a rock and roll song. But of of course I know like most of the lyric is like heavy, heavy, like on the lyric side and a little bit, the, the only difference is like, there's a little bit more focus on musical like parts that are written, but a lot, see a lot of that stuff comes out in the studio when we recut it because like we'll cut it to like a some sort of demo with like the producer that day in Nashville like David Garcia is a, a collab, like a big co-writer of mine and and he'll kind of flush out some parts but then we'll take that to the studio and really dial those in and that's like could be weeks or months later but the process of sitting down and maybe or somebody just being like I got this idea called Jim Bob and then like you write a song called I mean, it, it it's it's exactly the same if it's for me or if we're writing this, trying to write like a song that's like right down the gut like country song. Are you writing from reality or imagination? Both. Combination. Yeah. Very rarely reality. I feel like now, it's very industrialized. I think in a way where like I think I feel like the Nashville process is very. Which it's so funny because. I feel like, you know, the lyrics and stuff, they feel more real and more like they came from real situations, maybe more than a lot of other genres, you know, like with stories and just how people can, can, I guess, story tell in Nashville, but very seldomly do I, I or, or any of my co-writers come in and be like, I have something on my heart or I just went through something. I need to get this out. We need to write about this today. Usually it's just like, man, I had this crazy story about this guy that did this thing and we should write a song called this idea based on that like it's usually it's usually made up but but sometimes it's it's real life wait in the truck it's made up yeah I, out of complete thin air <laughs> and no remnants from like i mean anything i mean nothing, nothing. it is a real thing like I mean, it's a very real thing it is but not literally nothing dude so where do you go for stories like that like what place do you travel to do you like what is there a seed that needs to start it? Are you alone? Like, I have no idea. I mean, wait in the truck was such an anomaly. Like, there, are, that song was one of those where we kind of just 
the three of us at the beginning that the uh, that were in the the first session of that writing writing that song looked up like an hour and a half later and we had the song and it was it was very we were very much there's like this there's a creative spirit that flows through people when there's a, like when you get a really 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 great song and I swear to God, you're like a vessel, and it's coming from somewhere else. I've heard and this before. I swear to God, that's that's what happened for Wait in the Truck. It happened for uh, Give Heaven's Mail was another. But there's just songs that like you're like I don't know how the fuck any of us came up with any of those lines, but like it just exists now. <laughs> how Which crazy! I, it's is like that? I think it's that's what I think is so cool about music, yeah. man. It's so powerful. I don't know. I mean, Wait in the Truck again. It was just so. None of us know how we wrote that song. It just it just kind of happened. <laughs> it's so it's so wild because that's another thing that's like very much shared. This idea that like the universe or some energy beams it through you, you know? Yeah. And you just go. But also to have that with collaborators in the room at the same time. Well, and the thing is that the best part about that is that the the best songs are when like everybody's on fire yeah. and everybody's on board with an idea. Like you you can't have to get the best product you you can't have any inhibition in the room. Like everybody's just got to be like on fire. And that, that I, I've, I've always pictured it like it's a ball that's like rolling or like even a snowball and you're all just, and it's just building and building and building. And, and um, the second that there's any sort of hold up, like even if you could have a great song and like get stuck on a second verse for an hour and it can ruin the song sometimes because everybody starts to feel like, we lost it. Like we lost that creative feeling. And sometimes you have to go back a week later and listen to it with fresh ears and jump back, you know, jump back into it or whatever. Hello, beautiful human. Every year, millions of gamers experience IGSS, inadequate gaming setup syndrome. Luckily, a cure has been found. You have to go beyond. With the Vibersonic Mattress by Beyond Sleep. This thing has six built-in subwoofers, USB ports for charging, LED lights so you never stub your toe, gives you an acoustic massage when you want it, plus adjustable degrees of comfort. This right here is the best way to game ever. Hear your IGSS today at beyondsleeptech.com. How do you notice when a song is done? Country, it's easy. Because <laughs> there's two verses, a course, three courses, and a bridge. There's rules to country, but the rock stuff, I don't know, it just depends. Depends on the format, I guess. What are the different like similarities between rock and country? Today? Like these days? Yeah. I mean, it's being written today, right? The, the genres are always evolving. Yeah, I mean, I think today the, 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 format, the, the, the format of a particular song um, are similar. I just think it's a verse, chorus, verse, chorus, and then where rock is different is something weird happens after the second chorus. And then could go into just a last chorus or could go into a bridge or a breakdown or whatever. And country typically these days, it's like after the chorus, there's a solo section and then a bridge and then a chorus. But they are very similar. I will say that. The album is great, by the way. You Thank should you. listen to Quit. We're going to put a link below. It's really Thank good. You. It's really, really good. It's different. It's, I mean, you could hear the evolution in your music if you really listen to your catalog. Do you get what I'm saying? Like, Yeah, I mean, totally. It, there's a transition that gets you to the place that we're at today. Yeah, I think so. Why was raw? Is it a challenge for you, or is it just creatively what's been pulling you? I almost feel like, and I'm not saying I'm doing it the right way. Like I know how to write the perfect rock song, but it seems to be a little. It's, it seems to be a little easier just because the lyrics can be a little more like free, I guess. Or like you can't say fuck in a country song. You know what I mean? <laughs> and you can't talk about like people doing cocaine or like what. It's just it's not as. It's just different. You definitely can talk about that, but I just, I don't know if it was as big of a challenge as it was. It was just something, kind of like you said, I mean, something that it was, it's always been in me, and I just think it's taken me a, a little bit of courage and a few records to, and to be honest, I owe a lot of it to my fans, and like how you play, like, we'll play, like Sold Out was the heaviest song that I had ever put out at a certain point time and then we played that live and and i'm like is this gonna resonate or are people gonna think i'm fucking bananas for like screaming in a song and then you see how well it does live and i'm like okay well my fans like it let's go back and and do that again and so i owe a lot of really jumping into the rock and roll thing to like my my fans and like the live show are you writing these rock records from reality or imagination 
I would say 50-50. Like, there's a song on the record, Live Forever. Like, I don't know a guy. I've never, like, then that song's about, like, talking to a, like, a murderer and, and, like, stuff like that. I've never had moments like that in my life. But then, like, a song like, um, Quit or Rockstar, like, that's kind of autobiographical. Like, those songs are obviously, like, exactly about me and, like, what I'm going through. Even, again, like, Sold Out, like, there's a lot of those songs are... Just about like my life and kind of what's happening in real time. Quit, yeah. How about Soul for Sale? No, Soul, Soul for Sale not for is sale? a character. Soul for Sale is very much a character. <laughs> <laughs> um, I uh, I mean, my mom was like, my mom went bananas when she saw that, that <laughs> track. She was like, "What the fuck?" <laughs> Soul for Sale is an idea that I wrote in Mexico like four years ago in my head, and I just sat on that hook for forever. And I dude, when when I wrote it, I I like wanted to pitch it to like MGK and freaking you know like Black Bear, and I just it just felt like that sad boy or dark kind yeah. of thing, and I just sort of held onto it and never found really the right combo until way later. But no, that is first of all, I don't believe in so I don't think that any of that shit is real. Um, but I tell people all the time, Johnny Cash didn't shoot a guy in Reno, and you know I didn't I didn't kill a guy for something because I found a girl on the side of the road and, you know not every song has to be true and Sulphur Cell is one of those you're not making deals with the devil no <laughs> got it thank you for being on the record yeah, yeah, yeah for sure yeah many people were wondering I know it's, it's it's I was shocked at the I wasn't I wasn't because I think in the rock world nobody gives a shit but in the country world like it, it raised a pretty pretty good bit yeah, of concern values and morals are very much upheld within country and by the way like Dude, it's like a, a genre that is woven with a lot of respect and also a lot of artists, like, to artist respect. I've, like, said it a bunch of times, but, like, it's the only genre, like, when we worked in radio, we'd hear stories of, like, an artist would be at number one, and then they'd call programmers and be like, play my song less so this person could get their shot at number one. Mm. Like, that doesn't exist like, mm. in other worlds. Like, that's, like... That's crazy. Yeah, it doesn't, like, dude, the pop world doesn't work, operate that way. Yeah, I don't know if the rock world does either. No, but country definitely does. Yeah. There's this, like, They unity. cooperate a lot more yes. with each other, for sure. Camaraderie amongst each other and this elevation of, like, and a belief that a rising tide could float all boats. Yeah, Nashville is... I have I've said that for a long time. Like nobody there there is no like drama or pettiness. Not that I've really witnessed where people have done some really shady shit to keep people from having success. <laughs> I mean, not in since I've been in the arena or whatever. I mean, people there's there's people that don't like people, but that's you know that's pretty normal. But it's com it's competitive, but everybody is still rooting for everybody's success no matter what yeah like you're rooting for the genre at the end of the day yeah you're rooting for the lifestyle you yeah know? For you're, sure. you're rooting for the overall aesthetic and brand because you all make it up it's it's very cool yeah that's i mean it's it's true yeah god, god i should move to nashville it's yeah. <laughs> was there any thought of not recording this album in nashville and trying something new nope you're like this has to be where it is i just like sticking to my my writers and my my producer and yeah. Can you tell us the story of Quit? Because I know you've told it before, but I just think the story is great and fascinating. Okay, I was with, like, I think it was six buddies of mine. We were in Orange Beach, Alabama. Um, and the very, the furthest eastern point of Orange Beach becomes Florida. So that's the last, like, city until Florida, and and so there is a bar, which it's really popular, but I think it's more popular if you're from, like, the south or southeast, and it's called the Floribama, and that bar sits on the line of Florida and Alabama, <laughs> hence the name, <laughs> and s me and, and five other buddies stayed at a, uh, a big condo on the beach uh, called the Phoenix Tent, I'll never forget, and we had, we were all songwriters, and only one guy in the group at the time had a hit um, as a writer and the rest of us didn't have shit. We just, we wrote and we, we were all, we all knew like we had pretty decent songs, but long story short, the Floribama has, is one of those bars that has like seven rooms. It's a giant bar. And we were playing this little small room and we split up into two groups of three and each of us played for like an hour and a half, uh, writer's round style, right? So we would just go in order and we would play these songs that we had written that nobody had ever heard. And long story short, we had a tip jar 
And at the end of the night, someone at some point, because we were seeing people like every now and then walk up and throw a dollar in there, whatever, whatever it was. But we emptied the tip jar and we had, you know, 70 bucks, whatever it was, amount of money. And there was a napkin in the tip jar and somebody had written quit on it. And it was, and, you know, quit. And I think it was underlined with two exclamation points. And the it's like the least movie-esque thing ever. Like we weren't like, <laughs> Oh, shucks. You know, I just, I like, we were like, whatever. But I grabbed it and I put it in my pocket. And somehow that the napkin made it back to Nashville. We literally drove down there, which was like eight hours, drove back and I, it made it back to Nashville. And I don't, to this day, I don't remember how. I don't remember if I like put it in a fucking Ziploc bag or anything. I had no idea. But when I f found it, like unpacking my bag, I stuck it onto like a cork board that I had going into my little shitty little music studio and I would walk by it for years and years and years and like write songs and I just kept it and um, the more success I had the more kind of a the a symbol of, it became of you know to never give up I guess kind of thing and so anyway fast forward 10 years later now just it's just a little tip of the hat to that that moment in my life and, and not just me but my buddies who we have now all become successful I think every single person that was there uh, has now written a uh, like a number one song, which oh. is pretty cool. <laughs> Holy shit! Pretty cool. And the napkin on the album cover is the exact napkin from that. I day. literally took a photo with my iPhone and, and like tried to perfectly crop it, and that is the so the album is the exact. It is the napkin, and now I have it like framed, and it's in my Before studio, here. and it's like an actual. Isn't it next thing. to an award? Uh, I was for the longest time. I kept to keep it flat <laughs> and to keep the. Uh, the light from from um, ruining it. Yeah, I put my ACM songwriter of the year award <laughs> on top of it for a long time. Sick. Yeah. <laughs> Why did did you think in the past that you were going to use that napkin as an album title, or is there something about this no, rock I, album where you're like, this is it's time for this? The the I really didn't really think about it until I think two years ago um, when I won um, ACM songwriter of the year. They don't televise that award. But they have an award show called the ACM Honors, and they host it at the Ryman, and they they present a lot of the awards that they don't televise. So like Musician of the Year, and there's like an Icon Award, which went to Tim McGraw, and like there's an American Poets Award, which goes to like an old songwriter who's had a ton of success. Uh, all these different awards, and they host they have it at the Ryman, and so they presented my award um, there, and. The, the guy that was winning, this is such a crazy story, but the guy that won the American Poets Award that night, his name is Sonny Throgmorton, and he was a huge hit songwriter through like the, I think, 60s, 70s, 80s, and maybe even in the early 90s. Um, and I'm sitting next to my wife, and when they presented his award, and it was before they presented my award, and which my wife knew about the napkin and the story because we lived together and all that, um, I looked at her when they said, you know, this is to Son Sonny, and they gave this whole award. And I said, Callie, he was there. He was in that room the night somebody put the napkin in the tip jar. He just happened to be there. <laughs> and he came up to us and like, man, you guys are awesome. Y'all from Nashville, you songwriters, your songs are great, blah, blah, blah. And I remember my buddy being, being like, yeah, that's Sonny Throckmorton. He's like a legend songwriter, and we thought it was super cool. So then Callie was like, you have to tell that story in your speech tonight. And so when they gave me that award... I went up there and I made the, the there's an edited version that you you don't get to hear my whole speech but I was like Sonny was there the night that this happened and I told this whole full circle story. That's Long story crazy. short, that kind of went viral and then it it just meant a little bit more after that and now that people knew my story and all that and so that was kind of when I decided to maybe dedicate the next album to that to the napkin or whatever. Damn, Dude, so the know, universe is story. crazy, <laughs> right? Whatever so, you want to like attribute all that to, that's wild. Wild. What do you attribute it to? Do you feel like you need a reason or an explanation? What do you mean? That guy is there the same day. Like, I don't know. It's like a very full circle moment. Like, that's something large. Something larger is constantly at play. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. It's cool. It was the most, there is not, there has not been a more full circle moment, I don't think, in my, in my life or in my, in my, not even my career, but my entire life. Is there, do you collaborate the same with everybody? Or do you tailor your like sessions or what you're doing or what you go in with or whatever to the person you're about to work with? Does that enter your mind at all? Yeah. Um, no. Every 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 combo is different for sure. Um, musically, like 
I bring certain ideas to certain because these days in Nashville, they call them track guys, but they're just basically we're just catching up to LA and there's producer writers in the room now, right? So I'll bring in certain ideas for certain guys because I know that that I think like who the writers are going to handle the top line and, and be able to write the great song. But even like if there's a vibe I have in my head or an idea that fits a vibe, like I definitely won't bring it into certain people because I don't think that it's their strength as opposed to bringing it into a, somebody that I'm like, this guy's going to kill this demo and this idea, mm -hmm. if that makes sense at all. And also like pairings in rooms, like you can have four of the biggest songwriters in the world, but if they're all leaders like creative leaders and they're all kind of trying to bulldoze each other you're not going to get anything done so it helps to kind of have a very dynamic room where everybody has a or each person has a spe specific skill set um you know and no two people in the room are the same that's that's typically like a a good that is set up for a good day will you write songs alone i've written two songs alone in the past 10 years but i plan on doing it more I start a lot of songs alone, like even if it's a chorus or just a verse or something, but I've only written two, but I cut both of them. Really? Six Feet Under is one of them. Cool. Why'd you do that originally? Why were those songs needed to be done alone? I sat down to write it and couldn't stop. <laughs> just like, you know, it's like just walking away from, I could just feel the feel the momentum and just just couldn't walk away from it. Six Feet, feet Under was a little different because it was so personal that I, I felt like I... It almost said it would be weird if I wrote, wrote it with anybody else. And, and it was like so much like my story that I just like, I wanted to tell that story. But the other song was on the Mockingbird and the Crow. It's called Happy. And that was one. Like, I just, I could not, like, I couldn't walk away from it. So I just, over a few hours, I just finished it. How'd you pick your collaborators for this album? Because it's an interesting group of people. Man, I, they're, they're all kind of crazy. Knox, so there's a band called Bill Murray. Have you ever heard of them? Yeah. They're fucking awesome. She's like, hell yeah. I, I'm a huge Bill Murray fan. Um, I was like a secret guest vocal on a song um, that Bill Murray had uh, two albums ago called Corn Fed Yetis was the name of the song. Um, and it was myself. And then an actual featured vocalist was Knox. And obviously uh, Johnny or, or Bill Murray, the lead singer Bill Murray. Um so I met Knox through that process and then uh, never went in the studio with him. But then when Bill Murray came to Nashville to perform, Knox is a Nashville kid. So he was there. And so I finally got to meet him in person. Then I discovered his music and I was like, I love his music. And so uh, with Happy Hour, it was just, we were kind of, we were like, we, I, I want some features. And I was like, man, this sounds like it could be a Knox song. Let me ask Knox, you know, if he would do it. So that was that. I met, um, Chad Smith at the Super Bowl um, <laughs> this year. Uh, I actually met him. We were staying at the same hotel, and he was coming out of a, a different elevator as I was at the same time, and I was with my wife, and I was like, holy shit, it's Chad Smith. And I just went up and said hello, and, like, I didn't – I don't – I hate, like – if somebody doesn't know who I am, I'm not going to tell them who I am. Like, I, I have a complex about that. Like, I'm not going to be like, I'm a singer. I'm from – like, I hate that shit. <laughs> So I just went up and was like, I just want to shake your hand. Like, I'm a big fan. See you around, whatever. And then we get to this, like, little sweet thing that we watched the Super Bowl from. And in there is Chad Kroger from um, Nickelback. And he's talking to Chad Smith, who I just introduced myself to, like, an hour before. And I know Chad Kroger very well. So he, he motioned me over and reintroduced me to Chad Smith. And then Chad was like, we met in the the hotel lobby. And I was like, yes. And I was like, fuck yeah. <laughs> and... um Anyway, long story short, we hit it off. We talked for like an hour, exchanged numbers, and then like a week later, I just asked him. I sent him the 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 demo, or maybe I sent him like the 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 cut of the song, and and asked if he would play on it, and he knocked it out in like a week. And then Fred Durst, uh, I owe that all to Greg, who is here. He's he's somewhere, probably listening to this behind me or something. But um, Soul for Sale, uh, there were no no verses, but we took it to the studio. And I remember uh, Jerry Rowe was the drummer, and he was playing the drums. And the way he he played that verse beat, it was so like new metal. It was so like Incubus or Linkin Park or like Limp Biscuit vibes. And and um, there were no verses, so we just cut like what we thought a verse length would be, and you know, kind of was like, took it from there. And Joey Moy, my producer, was like, um, he was like, you should see if Greg can get 
this to Fred Durst. And so I immediately in the studio was like, can you send this to Fred Durst? Or, and and I, like a week later, I was in Italy and um, Greg texted me and said, hey, you're probably going to get a text from Fred Durst today about this song. And that, I mean, sick. it was fucking wild. And then, yeah, I, it, it, all of them, it just worked out like a dream. It was really cool. Really wild. Good eclectic group of people. I mean, it I'm, is. I never, even a year ago, I would have just, I would have never, never dreamed. And they were all just very, I don't know, just all converged in very different ways, which is really cool. Yeah, but you had Jeremy McKinnon on the the last album. Yeah. That's not a feature I was would ever expect to see. Yeah, dude. I, I, um, Jeremy, like, followed me on Instagram, or maybe I followed him and he followed me back. I don't remember, but... So we started talking on there, and I I was like a huge A Day to Remember fan growing up, and yeah, I, that was just another one where I wrote that I wrote that song in Nashville with like Nashville writers, and then sent it to him and asked him if he wanted to feature on it, and he just knocked it out the next week or whatever. Does he teach you anything about having like a sustainable scream that you can actually do every night on tour? He hasn't like fundamentally told me, but he's referenced me to some people that that would help me and I'd, I'm gonna eventually have to do that it's cause you're screaming like every night now if you're performing these songs like, yeah you like have a to. lot like probably half at least half the, the set now and how is that affecting your voice as the shows go on I don't see it it hasn't been too bad recently um but I'm sure over time it's probably not Just great not at all yeah how are you building your sets these days is it gonna be rock and country right now it's 70% rock and 30% country. But even the country stuff, a lot of the country stuff is like still like on the heavier side. Like I would say Wait in the Truck and One Beer are the two like just like very like country country songs, but then we have like I don't know, like even Give Heaven Some Hell is almost more like a rock song and like there's country songs that we yeah. even kind of beef up a little bit, but yeah, 70/30 I would think right now. That's fun. Yeah. And I think it'll, to a, a certain extent, it'll always be that way. I would love, I really, really want to, and I don't know if it'll be next year, but I want to do a set where I play half the set is country, like 45 minutes of country songs, and then have like a, fi not even like a, not a, uh, an intermission, because I don't want to lose people, you know, but like then have a five minute something in the middle, and then somehow the set changes and it everything goes dark and scary and we do like a rock set to finish That's it. cool. I would love to do something like that. And you have so many country hits, you know what I mean? Like, why would you, why do you keep them from the world? And I, I want to continue to, so maybe the more that we have, you know, the, the more that idea can come to life. What's it like recording vocals on a rock album compared to a country album? Because your voice does sound different on both styles. Yeah. Do you have to like turn like the country twang on, if you will, when a you're recording bit. country? A little bit. Do you ever catch yourself in the in the studio doing the wrong thing? You're like, oh, this is supposed to be a rock album. Not really. I mean, th thankfully, um, we've all if we cut if if I record like vocals on three or four songs a day, it'll be the same. Like it'll You're be either three or four face. country songs or three or four rock yeah. songs. Really, and a lot of that's not accidental, but it's hard to like cut a rock song and then like have the same like voice to go try to cut a country song. What's the biggest difference between being a writer and an artist? Nobody knows you at the grocery store if you're a writer. <laughs> but are writers to a certain degree still artists, right? I think writers are the artists a lot, many, many times. I think there's still a bunch of great artists in Nashville, but the writers are the true, the people making the art. And then I think the the the, the artists a lot of times are the frames that are holding it, you know. Were you nervous about making the transition from being a writer to an artist? I was apprehensive about it, for sure. All my buddies were signing record deals and... They were like, you know, when I told them that I had an had an offer, I had a lot of buddies that were like, just know, like, you're not going to get to go hunting, you're not going to get to go fishing, you're not going to get to go to the bars with your buddies when you get home, and when you do get home, you're going to want to sleep all day, and like, it was a very, there a lot of warnings, and and all that ended up being true, like I'm, you know, there was definitely a few years where it was, it was tough, but um, yeah, when I got offered my deal, it was, it was... I think three or four months of like just thinking about it a lot before commitment. Yeah, because like, I mean, the truth is like as a writer, I mean, you make more money as an artist, obviously. But if you're, if you're successful. Yeah. Yeah. And as a writer, I mean, you could still make good money, but it's hard. It is. But man, I'll, I'll be honest with you. If you, if you're an artist to really make good money, 
it, it all depends on your record deal, but let's just pretend that, you know, everybody has the same record deal. You got to be killing it pretty good to to make the money that a songwriter could make if they wrote two number ones a year. That. Yeah. Because you could do more, like, you have more free time. Like, you have the opportunity to get up and swing a bunch as yes. a writer. Yeah. Definitely that. But, I mean, like, you have to be, like, you have to either have to get, like, on a, a great tour and, and be getting a good check from that tour or be selling the shit out of some sh tickets and merch to, to really, like, make the money that... And I'm not talking about, like, amphitheaters. Like, once you get there, you're good. Like, if you're playing big sheds and stuff like that, but even, even like, you know, if you're selling out 2,000-cap venues, you know, you you got to play a lot, either, like, grind your ass off for a year or, um, or yeah, be playing just, I don't know, like, you just, you got to be killing it pretty good to make money off of it. And I'm not, you know, if anybody's listening, I'm not trying to talk anybody out of it, but just for the sake of your question, like, if you if you have a few hits a year as a songwriter, it you you can do pretty pretty good. Why'd you start writing music to begin with? Why'd you want to like figure out how to write a song? That is a question I don't know if I'll ever be able to answer. <laughs> you don't understand like why you sat down. Do you remember the first song you wrote? Yeah. What was it? It's called Caroline. About someone? That was a made up story about a girl. <laughs> I don't really remember much about it, but I remember the song. Um, I have no idea. I always had a passion for like like just writing. Like I was a decent student, but I excelled in English and writing like always. And uh, I don't know. I loved. I grew up loving music, and I don't know. I mean, the like wh why I started writing songs, I have no idea. Did you know that Caroline was good? Like, what did you feel about the song? Like afterwards, at the like, time, I thought it was good. <laughs> yeah. I mean, good enough for you to keep doing it and try to write another. Yeah, I mean, when I wrote that, I was like seventeen or eighteen, and that song is actually very um, uh, monumental for my move to Nashville because I, when I graduated high school, I moved or I went to a junior college. It was like twenty miles down the road, and throughout the you know seven eight months that i was there six months whatever it is i would play that song every now and then in front of like buddies or whatever and then you know like later on they'd be like hey play, play the song you wrote because i like to play guitar so i was playing fucking wagon wheel and shit you know like the just anything i knew how to play but i had a group of buddies that were like that really were that based on that one song they they hyped me up and they were like because I had, at that point, it was like, I think I might want to move to Nashville. I had discovered that songwriting, you can get a job just writing songs and all that stuff. And just from that song, like, my buddies were hyping me up to the point where they were like, that's good enough. Like, we should do it. And I, and I guess what I mean by that is, like, I trusted them and, and they, they were the extra push that kind of pushed me to Nashville that made me believe that I could actually do it. I had support from my family and stuff too, but you never know when your family yeah. is just bullshitting. Yeah, you, but your you friends know? are going to be honest with you. Exactly. That's real friendship. Yeah. Really special. When you have a song like more like My Hometown, was that just you and Morgan Wallen in the studio or was that did that start with you and you brought it to him? That was, that was me, Morgan, Ernest, uh, and uh, Charlie Handsome, who's a big... Uh, a writer with Morgan. Um, we wrote that song. That was I. I had the idea, but I remember like it was like doing that song was like doing surgery. Like it, it took us forever to kind of figure out the hook. But we wrote that song. I think in like 2017, um, at like 10 o'clock at night, which is very rare. Um, not rare, but for country, it's rare. Yeah, it doesn't happen mm -hmm. a whole lot. But I just remember we were we were all in a, in a room at Big Loud at a record label, and um, I just remember like I had that idea, but we it took us like we had to talk about it, like kind of hash out all the different angles of how you could write that idea, um, and we finally sort of landed on like this girl's leaving and the guy doesn't want to leave, so he wants to stay. So I can't love you more than my hometown, whatever. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it, other than that, it was just like a normal writing session, but it was just it was at night. But yeah, it was, and Morgan was like, Morgan is a great writer, and um, I don't know if people say that enough, or maybe they do, but but I remember um, he and I just like hyper focused on it because we knew like if we were like if we nail this, I feel like it could be a really good song, and and um, 
we really got in the weeds on that one and and just I, it felt like we were doing surgery because like we would say something but then that would negate this but this was better than that so then we would go back and fix that so it made sense for this and it was just like a lot of that kind of stuff Re rewiring and shit did you know the entire time that like this song was going to work because there's a lot of people who be like if, if we're working this hard on a song like maybe it's not meant to be for that sp specific song yeah only because Morgan was such a believer in that song. We wrote that song like a few months after his debut album came out. So, and that, but more than my hometown was ended up being on Dangerous, which means it survived like f fucking like three years, I think, of like, wow. you know, great songs going, you know, him hearing great songs, him writing great songs. All that stuff. And he just, he was always a believer. He would text me all the time and be like, I still love the song. And I'm like, me too. Please, <laughs> please record it. And just, you know, ended up being a hit. What have you learned from working with somebody like Morgan Wallen? Like on the writing side or? I mean, just being in the studio with him. I mean, I'm assuming every artist you've ever written with is different, you know? One good, one thing that I love about Morgan, especially when you're creating with him. <laughs> is that he is so brutally honest and I wish that every writing, every artist that you wrote with would just be like, I think that line sucks because Morgan will literally just say that. And I know that he and I are very close and the closer you are with somebody, the, the more honest you can be, but I don't think it matters. I think he would say that to anybody. And that's something that I've learned maybe is to be less passive when somebody's like fighting for a line, especially like if I'm, I'm in a group of people and maybe this person keeps saying this line and we're writing the song for me. And I'm like, I would never say that just being vocal about that. That's something that he's all, he's been very, very good at. It's just being like, I don't, I don't like that. Let's, let's keep trying. Or like, you know, he wouldn't necessarily say that line sucks, but he's the first person to be like, I wouldn't say that. Let's keep fighting. And that's a, that's a good way to be because I think you get the best stuff when you're just more, uh, honest with your creators. Oh, honesty, yeah, and just not complacent and just taking the first idea. You take the best idea. Yeah, exactly. Fighting for it a little bit harder. F1 Trillion, you're on that album. Yeah, dude. How's it been working with Posty? Because you guys have done some other stuff on the Hicks tapes too, right? Yeah, he did the, he sang uh, Pickup Man on the, the Joe Diffie mm -hmm. um, Hicks tape we put out. The, uh, actually, shit, almost a year ago. No, it came out this year. Um, it's great, man. I was so, I'm just so thankful to be a part of that project. How does that conversation begin? Like, who comes to you? Like, how does it start in your world? So, Charlie Handsome, who is now, like, lives in Nashville, I think, full-time, and he's, like, Morgan's main, like, writer, collaborator, um, came from L.A., and he was one of Mor uh, one of Post Malone's um, producers, writer, collaborator from L.A., but he came to Nashville and he started writing with all of us and, and just, I guess he enjoyed it or whatever. And he and Morgan got really tight. So they started writing. So, and that, that was like seven years ago. Um, so just over the course of all those years, like, and Charlie would come back out to LA and he would do these rights. And he, like, I know he produced like a lot of Khalid shit and, and uh, would uh, produce like uh, Post Malone stuff. Anyway, long story short, here's seven years later, Charlie was like, and I'm kind of paraphrasing, but it was basically like, hey, guys, get ready. Post is ready to come to Nashville and write a country record. And which I'm like on the sideline. Like I'm 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 friends with Charlie. Like I'm tight with Charlie, but really Ernest, Ernest and um, Morgan are really, really tight with Charlie. But my manager knows Charlie well and, and um, Seth England. And he he would he called me and he was like, hey, just letting you know, like Post is coming to town to write a country record. I'm sure that you're going to end up in one of those rooms. Just letting you know, blah, blah, blah. But long story short. Um, they started putting writing rooms together when it actually came time for him to come to town. And uh, I just, I got the call and we just kind of ended up hitting it off and, and writing a bunch of songs together over six months or whatever. How many songs did you guys write together? He and I? Yeah. We attempted probably a hundred, um, <laughs> but we probably wrote, we probably completed, oh, I don't know, five or six maybe. What'd you learn from working with him? I definitely learned a very different process. Something I learned from from him as a person, though, is that like he makes everybody in the room feel important and like appreciated. He's very kind. He's like one of the biggest 
musicians or music celebrities, I guess, in the world. I mean, in the past ten years, and he, you would never know it. Like he's a very, he's just very down to earth. Um, it was a testament to like times where I would be irritated or didn't want a lot of people in the room or you know, whatever it was, like, didn't feel like I needed to speak to everybody in the room. And I'm like, man, this guy is like one of the biggest celebrities in the world. And he's going around in a circle and shaking people's hands. And that was just, it was really cool to see somebody with, you know, that, that I know for a fact has a million people pulling him a million different directions and he can still make time to say hello to everybody and be respectful. I thought that was really cool on a personal level. I did learn that there uh, work hours are completely ass backwards from <laughs> hours in Nashville <laughs> and that he would text me and be like show up around 6 and I would show up at 6 and then we would stay there from 6 a.m. or 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. <laughs> and that but it's it's fun but at the same time like when when he would text me and say I'm coming to town I would literally start sleeping later and like <laughs> just trying to like adjust because I'm like okay I know the next few nights are going to be like I'm going to be Basically, like I have jet lag for a few days. <laughs> was the creative process similar to what you've always done? Or? Yeah. Well, that's that's the great thing about that's what I love about what he did. Other than the time frame, which like you know, instead of starting at eleven, we started at night. But he came to Nashville and he sat and he like listened. He didn't, and I don't mean that like he he is a great writer. He's a great writer and he's a great he can write country lyrics like everything about it. Uh, but but what I mean is like he came here or came to Nashville and said, I want to do this the way that you guys do it. And he had like songwriters that the world have, has never heard of, but they're like in Nashville, they're hit. They've written tons of hit songwriters, but he didn't just want me and Ernest and Morgan and Brad Paisley and Eric Church and Tim McGraw. Like he was like, who are the, who are the good songwriters in this town? I want to write with those guys. So like I'd walk in the room and, and it would be, Red Akins or a guy named Josh Thompson. I mean, these people that are like amazing songwriters, but basically he he immersed himself into the songwriting culture of the town. Um, and I respect that a lot. Like he, there were no, he didn't care about who anybody was. He just wanted to get the best song. And so he pulled in the, the best people for that job and made a great record because of it. Really special. It's, it's Dude, it's, it's the coolest thing that I have witnessed in Nashville because I've heard the record. I know how good it is. It's like the coolest thing that I've witnessed since I've been in town to see somebody come and do it that way. And I'm not knocking anybody else's process, but he didn't write a bunch of country songs with a bunch of people that aren't country or don't speak that language. He came here or so I keep, I know we're in LA. He came to Nashville and, um, and did it with people that know how to speak the language. And, and, and again, just a great record came out of that. Genius exists in things like that, you know? Understanding, like, knowing what you don't know is the greatest skill. 100%. Two quick questions that kind of tie together. But on Rockstar, you said you have all your idols sliding in your DMs. Yeah. Who who comes to mind when you when you say that line? If it's not if it's not just DMs, it's like, like a, a text from mm-hmm. somebody. Corey Taylor was one of the first ones. Oh, sick. We love Corey Taylor. Yeah, we had him a couple months ago. Really? Yeah. yeah he's great. Matt from Avenged Sevenfold. Like a, it's, a lot of it's like metal guys, but yeah, it's all rock. Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, that goes to my second question. At the ACMs, you said like your dream collab right now is Mike Shinoda from Linkin Park. We love I would him love too. that. Yeah, yeah. I would love he's that. He's incredible. Um, he's amazing. I don't, does he do collabs? Like, I, oh, wait, he just did something. <laughs> no, yeah. he, uh, he does, like, I don't know. It's very sporadic. Yeah. What did he do? I think he just produced or wrote a song with, uh, do you know who Swaco is? Yeah. 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 I think he maybe did some stuff with them, but yeah, I would love, I mean, Dude, I'm if it's like new metal, that was like the my heavily the my most influential or uh, influenced years were like was that era. So, but I'm a, yeah, I'm, I mean, I love Mike Shinoda. It'd be awesome. And then I just just realized this like so we're talking about country and rock, but then Snoop and Dre reached out to you to do like a gin and juice remix. Yeah. I mean, you're just covering everything these days. <laughs> yeah, that was wild. Um that was that was a um my my manager called me one day and was like, a, "Are you sitting down?" Moment, and said like, "Jimmy Iovine just called me," and he was like, "I so just so you know, like I'm not homies with Jimmy Iovine. Like I'm freaking out. My manager saying this, like I'm freaking out that Jimmy Iovine called me." <laughs> um, and uh, just said, "Man, 
you got the you got the call for he basically said Snoop and Dre are putting out gin and juice the product like the the thing as the as the 30 year anniversary mm-hmm. of of the song and they want someone to do a country version of that and you are for some not for some reason I mean <laughs> no you are for some reason yeah the guy and the kind of the rest is history I mean it I was my mind was blown, and like a week later, I was on a Zoom call with like Dr. Trey, and we're talking about like the music video and the, <laughs> the musical direction and all that. But it was that was like one of those. Sometimes you just you're somebody threw out your name, and you just kind of got lucky, and yeah, got lucky. But don't you ever want to know like who was it? Like was it? I actually found out who it was. Okay, and it was um, so the guy that runs Live Nation in Nashville. So he puts on all the big Live Nation festivals like Faster Horses and. Um, Lake Shake and Tidal Wave, and Tortuga, like all these big uh, country festivals. His name is Brian O'Connell, and uh, he's a he's a good friend of mine now. Um, I've gotten to know him really well over the past few years. But apparently, Jimmy called Brian and asked uh, who he thought would be a good fit to do this that record, and Brian said me. Wow, and I have. Many times, thanked Brian. I, I, I've let him know that I, I heard that and I knew about it. It was pretty cool. I'm sick. Yeah, I just think the song "I Don't Miss" kind of sums up everything we've been talking about today. <laughs> True. You know what I mean? Just <laughs> hit after hit after hit, and it just opens up all these doors for you. That's just my like. I have to have like an asshole or a cocky outlet, <laughs> and that's that's it for sure. I love that song though. I mean, I, I it's a fun song. Yeah. Listen to the album. Quit. Link below. Really appreciate you taking the time and Dude, hanging I today. enjoyed this. I, I feel like I, I chat. I, I did a lot of talking today, which is not always the case, but I, I appreciate it. No, dude, that's the point. I appreciate you being here. Thank you very much. Hardy, everybody. Woo!